In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgression unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil, and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins. And trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. to God on high.
Let us pray. O Lord, we pray that your grace may always go before and follow after us, that we may continually be given to all good works. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The first lesson for the 16th Sunday after Trinity is written in the first book of Kings, chapter 17. Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, What do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him from her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and laid him on his bed. Then he cried out to the Lord, O Lord my God, have you brought tragedy also upon this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried to the Lord, O Lord my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry, and the boy's life returned to him, and he lived. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, Look, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second lesson is written in St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 3. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, 
which are for your glory. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. 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 Trust in the Lord, He is their help and their shield. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the seventh chapter. Glory be to you, O Lord. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, His heart went out to her, and he said, Don't cry. Then he went up and touched the coffin, and those carrying it stood still. He said, Young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O
Dearly beloved, Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Matthew, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In the last chapter of Mark, our Lord promises, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. And the Apostle Peter has written, baptism now saves you. The Word of God also teaches us that we are all conceived and born sinful and are under the power of the devil until Christ claims us as his own. Therefore depart, you unclean spirit, and make room for the Holy Spirit. How are you named? Finn Alexander Hempel. Receive the sign of the Holy Cross, both upon your forehead and upon your heart, to mark you as one redeemed by Christ the crucified. Let us pray. O almighty and eternal God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, I call to you on behalf of your servant, Finn Alexander, who asks for the gift of your baptism and desires your eternal grace through spiritual rebirth. Receive him, Lord, and as you have said, ask and it will be given to you, Seek and you will find, knock and it will be opened to you. So now give your blessing to him who asks and open the door to him who knocks so that he may obtain the eternal blessings of this heavenly bath and receive the promised kingdom that you give. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Again, let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, who according to your righteous judgment condemned the unbelieving world through the flood, and in your great mercy preserved believing Noah and his family, and who drowned hard-hearted Pharaoh and with his army in the Red Sea, and led your people Israel through the same sea on dry ground, thereby foreshadowing this bath of your holy baptism, and who, through the baptism of your beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, sanctified and set apart the Jordan and all water to be a blessed flood and a rich and full washing away of sins. We pray according to the same boundless mercy that you would graciously behold Finn Alexander and bless him with true faith in the Spirit so that through this same saving flood, all that has been born in him from Adam and we, which he himself has added thereto may be drowned in him and be engulfed. Grant that he be separated from the multitude of unbelievers preserved dry and secure in the holy ark of the Christian church, and serve your name at all times, fervent in spirit and joyful in hope, so that with all believers he may be made worthy to attain eternal life, according to your promise. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Hear now the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark. They brought little children to Jesus that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And he took them up in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord preserve your coming in and your going out, both now and even forevermore. Finn Alexander, do you renounce the devil? Do you renounce all his works? Do you renounce all his ways? Do you believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth? Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, 
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting? Do you desire to be baptized? Finn Alexander Hempel, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Receive this burning light. Live always by the light of Christ and be ever watchful for his coming, that you may meet him with joy and enter with him into the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom that shall have no end. The Almighty God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given you new birth through water and the Spirit and has forgiven you all your sins, Strengthen you with his grace to life everlasting. Amen. Peace be with you.
Grace and peace to you from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus. There is a sense in which Jesus always surprises us. He always does more than we expect him to. He does it in a way that is totally different than we would, but always better. The love of Christ does always surpass our knowledge and expectations. There's one little word in our gospel for today that that indicates a surprise. Some translations just skip over this little word as we heard it from the NIV. You might have thought it wasn't even there, but it's there. It's a little word that means behold. Look. A word that calls attention to something surprising or or unexpected or extraordinary. Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a considerable crowd from the town was with her. Look, behold, a funeral procession. I suppose funeral processions are are something to see. It used to be that, that when you would see them, you'd stop whatever you were doing and watch and wait until it passed. Used to be, or it is true, that sometimes death comes suddenly by heart attack or accident and the circumstances might be surprising or shocking. But death itself is not a surprise. It's a certainty. Sometimes it might come under the most dreadful of circumstances, perhaps probably the the worst of all, when children die and their parents have to bury them. but nearly as bad and more common for spouses who are widowed and left all alone without their companion. It, even in the best of circumstances, say when a 98-year-old grandma dies, there may still be tears because death is sad, sometimes to the extreme, but it is not surprising. In fact, I suspect that the, that the reason that such a, a large crowd follows the woman and her dead son to the graveyard, the reason that, that we might watch as the hurts passes by, the reason we should all really take the opportunity to attend funerals in church is precisely because death is not a surprise. It's a mystery to us but no surprise. It's coming. So we should all go out to the grave too because we're all going to the grave. So we should not be surprised then when that death is coming, when our, when our bodies fail and fade, when suffering or sorrow comes. We're really just walking to the grave one step at a time. Which leaves us no reason for us to to ever say, I just can't understand what's happening to me. I didn't see this coming. Nor should we live as if death were not coming, as as if we weren't going to the grave. So we we never look at it. Don't, Don't think about it, plan for it, as if by not preparing for it or talking about it, we will somehow avoid it. The truth is this. We do all these things because we don't want to die. (laughs) And why is that? At least in part, because we love the world. And we love all the things of the world. We've become attached to it. And have foolishly deceived ourselves, foolishly oblivious to reality, So that when death does come, when death 
does make its way toward us, we find ourselves surprised. The truth is, if we don't expect it, don't prepare for it, it will surprise us, but that will be an unpleasant one. No. No, really, neither the funeral procession nor its sad circumstances are what we are to behold, what is surprising to us. Rather, it is this. It's not the funeral procession. It's the meeting of two processions. You see, in this account, you have Jesus and his crowd coming in, and the dead man and the mourners going out. The Lord of life is going one way, and death is going another. And what we see is that just outside the town gate, there, these two opposing crowds collide. Death, funerals, tears, sickness, sadness, loneliness, all of that is normal and ordinary in our fallen and sinful world. But behold, it's surprising when Jesus and those with him come into our ordinary, they come into our procession and hit it head on. It's so surprising that that St. Paul in our epistle today prays, prays that we would be able to behold this, to, to grasp just how wide and long and deep and high is the love of Christ. To know this love that surpasses knowledge. Behold, look with me at the collision of these two processions. First, Jesus had compassion on the woman before they even met. No one had told him her sad story. He simply looked at her from a distance, and even from a distance he could see her and knew. It says he had compassion. The word here is the kind of deep emotion that that hits you in the gut. All of her hurt, her her loss, her pain, her loneliness, even from a distance, Jesus saw it, knew it, and felt it. This is true sympathy. Second, Jesus says, do not weep. Now, he's not rebuking her. He's not telling her that she can never weep again. Even Jesus wept on the way to the grave of a friend. But before he raises her son, he instructs her not to go on weeping as if she had no hope. It's as if to say, don't weep now. I'm here. And if I'm here, then it's going to be all right. Third, Jesus touches the coffin. Now, this doesn't seem that strange to us, but but Jesus, understand that doing this would have rendered Jesus ceremonially unclean. Being ceremonially unclean was was not sinful, but it was God's way of teaching Israelites that even touching the effects of sin, like dead bodies, makes you unfit to come into God's temple, into God's presence. And the only way that you can come back into the temple is by sacrifice. By blood. Jesus goes and gets himself dirty, unclean when he comes into contact with human sinfulness and death. His touch tells you that he wants to be connected to you, he wants to be involved with you, and that his blood will cover you and cleanse you. Fourth, the procession stops. Jesus is able to do what man is unable to do. What all of our doctors, medicines, research, surgery, and makeup can't do, that is, can't stop the march of time towards the grave. Jesus stops it. Fifth, 
He says, young man, I say to you, arise. Jesus doesn't instruct the the doctors how to resuscitate him. He doesn't speak some trite condolence to the mother saying something like, well, he's in a better place, or, well, you'll always have him in your heart. No. Jesus speaks and addresses dead flesh. A newly rotting corpse. He speaks to ears that send no messages to a dead brain. And yet the dead man sat up. Because Jesus said so. Just as God spoke the heavens and the earth into existence, as as God breathed into Adam the breath of life, so what the God-man speaks is. Sixth. Then he gave him back to his mother. It's interesting that Jesus doesn't say to the man, come, follow me. Not everyone is called to leave everything and follow Jesus to be his full-time apostle. He's not even told to tell everyone what Jesus did for him. He is given to his mother. His Christian calling from Jesus himself is to be a son to his mother. That is, Jesus raised him from the dead so that he could simply live in his vocation. For there really is no better way to serve Jesus than by serving those to whom Jesus has given us. You and I are all on our way to the grave. Like it or not, it's where we have to go. And as we make our way, mourning, weeping, tired, alone, suffering, afraid, our only hope is that Jesus might show up and interrupt this procession. Behold. Behold, here he comes. He comes to you from the direction of the graveyard. For he's already been there. And that walk toward death that we're all on, he's already walked it. The grave that you fear, been there, done that for three days. And now he comes to you on your way. Already from a distance he's seen you and he knows the hurt. He knows even if no one else does And he himself feels and bears, has sympathy with you. He has compassion on you. Now that he's here, now no more weeping, not now. For before he he takes it away, before he fixes it, before he raises you or your loved ones, you have his word now. You have his promise. You You have him. Don't weep. And he touches you. It is in his touch that he shows just how involved he is with you. He was baptized in a river with sinners after all. And so when he touches you with water and the word and his holy name, he unites himself to you. Parents bring children to baptism for him to touch them. For in baptism, children, also on their way to the grave, are drowned and raised to new life in Christ. So that even if the worst happens, even if parents have to bury these children, they've been touched by Jesus. They're safe. And again, Jesus touches the dying. That is, you and me touches the dying with his living body and blood. He takes your uncleanness and he makes you clean by his blood. For he has already been in the grave. But having come out, he gives his living body and blood to you. That is, he touches you on your tongue, in your mouth, 
you cannot die forever. And finally, Jesus stops the procession because he speaks to dead flesh and makes it alive. He does that when he calls us from being dead in sins to alive through faith in him. And having brought us to faith, then what does he do? He gives us to our mother. Or father, son, daughter, brother, sister, neighbor, boss, employee, teacher, students, your mayor, your governor, your president. That is, he's given you new life to place you in vocation, to, to serve where you are needed. He raised the dead to put you here, where you are. Surprise. Look, God has visited his people. And that's why you have come here, to even today. Because Jesus has promised to be present here in word and sacrament. That's what we do here. So that you, who otherwise are just walking to the grave, might take a minute to stop. To be touched by Jesus, to hear him and live. So that when you go back out those doors, it's not just a funeral procession. No. No, you have been given life and a calling for each other until Jesus calls. And then we sleep for a while and we wait for him in the grave. Wait for Jesus to call again. And our dead ears will then hear his voice. And he says, young man, young woman, no matter how old, no matter how long it's been, I say to you, arise. Amen. Please stand. Peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We join in confessing the Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty.
in our prayers today, we include a prayer of thanks on behalf of Harold and Lila Jesuits on the occasion of their 70th wedding anniversary. For all those who have been raised to new life through baptism into Christ, that they would be strengthened by the Spirit, rooted and grounded in love, know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, and be filled with all the fullness of God, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this church throughout the world, and for an increase in faithful servants sent out into the harvest, that the proclamation of the gospel would resound in all places, sinners of all nations would hear and believe, and Christ's kingdom would be expanded, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who have been placed in authority over us, that they would serve with integrity and honor, seeking after peace and the common good of all. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who live in lands where persecution and poverty are severe, that they would put their trust in him who is able to do far more abundantly than we ask or think, and according to his will, find refuge in other more hospitable places. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for the sick and suffering, that God would incline his ear to hear our prayers, heal and restore them according to his will, and keep them in the faith that leads to eternal life. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. In thanksgiving for the joy and blessings that you have granted to Harold and Lila Jesuits in the 70 years of their marriage, that with true fidelity and love, they may ever honor and keep their promises, grow in love toward you, and for each other, and come at last to the joys you have promised, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who receive the Holy Eucharist this day, that they would re recognize that God visits his people at the holy altar in the very body and blood of Christ, receive forgiveness of their sins, have their faith strengthened, and depart in peace. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the saints who have gone before us and now rest from their labors, let us give thanks to the Lord, and that we would be kept in the faith until we are raised with them at the last day to dwell in Christ's kingdom, which has no end. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who having created all things, took on human flesh and was born of the Virgin Mary. For our sake, he died on the cross and rose from the dead to put an end to death, thus fulfilling your will and gaining for you a holy people. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Holy God, mighty Lord, gracious Father, you have filled all creation with light and life. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. You lifted Noah and his family in the ark, 
You promised to bless all nations through Abraham. You delivered Moses and the Israelites. You renewed your promises through the prophets. And now you have spoken through your Son, who in words and deeds proclaimed your kingdom and was obedient to your will. In your tender mercy you gave him, your one and only Son, to suffer death on the cross for our redemption. By the one offering of himself, he made there a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Therefore, gracious Father, remembering his blessed passion, mighty resurrection, and a glorious ascension, we humbly thank you for this wonderful gift of salvation through your Son's own body and blood. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor be yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
All give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this holy supper. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace.